I may give you a little indigestion here today. And we'll have question and answer this afternoon, but I want to talk to you this morning a while about two heresies among fundamentalists. And uh, fundamentalism has two false teachings in it, and these two false teachings are found in Bible-believing fundamentalism. But these two false teachings are found among those that do believe the King James Bible the Word of God. Just because you believe the King James Bible the Word of God, that doesn't make you exempt from false teaching. Also, that make you exempt from false living. And I haven't got any illusions about these matters. I know what the balance is. They think I'm unbalanced, but that's because they're unbalanced. And I'm going to talk to you about two heresies here this morning. The first of these, what we call Calvinism, it's up here. This one down here is called hyper Calvin, uh, hyper dispensationalism. It's called hyper Calvinism, hyper dispensationalism. We call this bunch here the tulip sniffers, and this bunch down here is called the dry cleaners. And both these things are taught. Now, I'm going to teach you, first of all, hyper Calvinism, just like a good hard-shell Baptist would teach it, and try to convert you and get you all convinced that what is to be shall be, whether it happens or not. And uh, how, many of you, how many of you know about primitive or hard-shell Baptist? Let us see your hand. All right, being, uh, you're a little bit far from Kentucky to get a whole lot of it up here, but it'll, it'll be up here. And uh, this uh, Calvinism is also taught in all the seminaries. But no way to get a higher education without running into Calvinism. You get to the graduate level, you run into it. All right, take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Now, here's how it's taught. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Now, I'll try to convince you, first of all, and then I'll give you the truth. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as he... That's God, hath chosen us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What that passage says there, God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. In Calvin's system, that means this. This eternity back here, and that's eternity up there, and this black line represents time. And the idea is in eternity back there, God chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. So there you are, in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's the teaching. All right, Ephesians chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25. You can see that if you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, you couldn't go to hell if you tried. All right, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What does that mean? That means when Christ came down and died on the cross, he gave himself for the church, which is his body. So when Christ came down and died on the cross, he died only for the saved elect that were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And this is called in Calvinistic theology, limited atonement. And it simply means when Christ shed his blood, there wasn't enough blood to go around. The blood only applied to the elect. Now, hard-shell Baptists will deny that vehemently and vigorously, but it doesn't make any difference. All hard-shell Baptists believe in limited atonement. John Calvin believed in limited atonement. They all believe in limited atonement. On Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, verse 11, talking about the atonement. This is to prove that Christ's blood was only shed for the elect, that is, for those chosen in him. Isaiah 53, verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. End of verse 12. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many. In plain words, Christ didn't die for everybody, just many. The many, of course, are reference to the elect, not everybody. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Christ gives his life as a ransom for many, not for everybody. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Not everybody, just many. So when Christ came and died on Calvary's cross, he didn't shed his blood for everybody. Christ came down, and Christ shed his blood just for the elect. They were predestinated to go to heaven because they were chosen in Christ, 
before the foundation of the world. You say, what about the rest of them? Well, they're predestinated to go to hell. And a Calvinist will deny that, say, no, we don't predestinate him to go to hell, but he's lying. If you have a decree of election, you have a decree of reprobation. And the decree of reprobation teaches the ones he didn't die for go to hell. And among other things, the reasons why they go to hell is the blood isn't applied to them. And the reason the blood isn't applied to them is because uh, it didn't, was never shed for them to start with. That's the situation. They said, no, the reason the blood wasn't applied to them is because, yeah, but that's beside the point. The point is they don't believe Christ shed his blood for unsaved people to go to hell. Limited atonement, that's what they believe. Now, you can see in this situation here that if you're born right, you go to heaven, you're born wrong, you go to hell, nothing you can do about it. <laughs> like an old hard shell said, you know, well, if what is to be, shall be. You believe that, don't you, you know? Spit into a number 10 honey can. <laughs> and I told him, I said, Pop, after you've been in hell burning 20 million years, it won't be any good to talk that way. And he said, well, I guess you got something there, you know. Pitiful, ain't it? Seventy-year-old man, one foot in the in the coffin, the other one raised to kick the bucket, trying to figure out the eternal decrees of God. Stupid thing to do. Oh, and here's the next thing. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, the idea is here is this. If you're chosen in Christ to be saved before you're saved, and the blood is shed for you, then your salvation is automatic. And if your salvation is automatic, then you have nothing to do with it. And this doctrine is called total depravity, which means that you're unable to do anything to save yourself, that the whole operation from start to finish is God's work, and you have nothing to do with it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespass and sins. Which means what? means out here in time you were dead in trespass and sins, and a dead man cannot respond, Right? Therefore, the Holy Spirit has to overcome this fellow and quicken him and give him the new birth before he can respond, because he's dead. He's totally depraved. That's the teaching. Now, in that system, do you see what follows? If the Holy Spirit quickens this fellow and gives him life, then he repents, and then he believes on Christ, because he couldn't repent until God quickened him, and he couldn't believe until God quickened him. So you have a backward salvation. The fellow is saved, and then he repents, and then he believes, and then he receives. And that has some interesting overtones. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 11, verse 18. Acts chapter 11, 18. Here is proof the man cannot repent of himself. Acts chapter 11, 18. Here is proof he has to be quickened before he can repent. Acts chapter 11, 18. Acts 11, 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then if God also to the Gentiles granted repentance. See? If God doesn't grant you repentance, you can't repent. So repentance is a gift as well as the rest of it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. 1 Timothy 2, 25. Isn't it amazing what you can prove with the Scriptures? 1 Timothy 2, Make it Second Timothy. Second Timothy 2.25. The devil can quote Scripture. Second Timothy 2.25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So if God doesn't give you repentance, you can't repent. So what happens here, this unsaved fellow is sitting out here, and he's one of the elect because he was chosen in Christ back here, so the Holy Spirit <coughs> quickens the fellow, gives him a new birth, and that gives him repentance, the ability to repent. So he repents and then receives Christ. All right. So I remember one time at the uh, fair Bob Jones years ago, I had a fellow named Whitty that I sat under. And Whitty was a five-point tulip Calvinist, as was Brokenshire and Barton Payne. And by the time I was going to get my master's degree, the, they, they gave me a hard time. They knew I was not a five-point Calvinist. I was a street preacher. They resented it. And uh, Whitty said one time in class to that class, it's wrong to ask a man if he's saved. And we won't know why. He said, because the saved were saved before the foundation of the world, so no man can put his finger exactly when he got saved, because he'd been saved all the time. 
Now, Bob Jones Sr. didn't know that was going on in his seminary until he called Whitty in and put him on the spot. When he put him on the spot, he realized what kind of a duck he had, and he fired him. That's the kind of situation you get in. When I was up for my master's degree, I had to face those fellows, and they said, Mr. Ruckman, they said, are you an Arminian or a Calvinist? I said, I'm an Arminian like I get to Calvary, and after that, I'm a Calvinist. <laughs> and they said, that isn't a very good answer. I said, it isn't a very good question. <laughs> And they asked me, they said this, they said, well, Mr. Ruckman, what happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object? See that stuff? The irresistible force is the Holy Spirit, meeting an immovable object, the dead sinner. Now, Calvin would say the irresistible force overcomes the immovable object. See, that's called, in their theology, that's called irresistible grace. But that ain't the answer. The answer is, if an irresistible force meets an immovable object, the irresistible force is deflected without stopping, and the immovable object is crushed without moving. Yeah, man, if a dictionary is right, right? Yeah, right, amen. All right, Romans chapter 9, 18. Romans 9, 18. Romans 9, 18. They had the guns in me from the time I got up there to the time I left, and I never knew it. I like a lamb led to the slaughter. I just little old dumb stumble bum coming out of the dance bands and ballrooms. I don't know what was going on. They took one look at me and they figured out my future before I knew it myself. I remember one day Payne called me in there, Barton Payne, and he said, Now you, your thesis won't pass the examining board. I said, Why not? He said, You don't have enough original source references. I said, well, I've got them at the start of my church history. He said, yeah, but you picked too big a subject. You can't cover them at the end of your church history. And I said, well, I said, uh, as I understand, this school has two standards. He said, what do you mean? I said, uh, if I understand Bob Jones Sr. right, this school has an academic standard, intellectual standard, and has a spiritual standard, a practical standard. I said, I tried to write something that was practical as well as scholarly. And Barton Payne reached over and showed me his thesis. He said, well, you should write a thesis more like this, he said. And pull out his thesis, and the big old thing about that big, Coptic, Aramaic, Syriac, uh, you know, Latin, Spanish, German, French, in it. And I said, what does your thesis prove? He said, my thesis proves that the Septuagint copy of uh, 1 Samuel came from the Hebrew instead of the Coptic. And I said, well, having proved that, what have you proved? <laughs> and he said, well, the, a thesis should just be the beginning of a lifetime work. For example, he said, I, he said, you might next take a project to prove that Second Samuel in the Septuagint was copied from the Hebrew, in, 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 uh, Septuagint copied from the Hebrew instead of the Coptic. And I said, well, if I understand Bob Jones Sr. right, this school has two standards, not just one. And that broke that up. And when the time for the examination came around, Barton Payne didn't show up. Old man the senior got suspicious and called him, gave him the boot too. All right, Romans 9, 18. Romans 9, 18. Therefore hath he mercy, and whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. All right? On whom he will have mercy, he will, and whom he hardeneth, he hardeneth. You see? Pharaoh never had a chance. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that willeth, you can't will to receive Christ. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So the unsaved man cannot by an act of will receive Jesus Christ. It is not of him that willeth. God will have mercy upon the elect because he chose him, and God will damn the unsaved because he didn't choose him. That's the setup. Those things are called the decree of election, the decree of reprobation. All hard shell Baptists and Calvinists believe just that. Romans chapter 9. So we are, Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel to go to hell and the other go to heaven? What if God wouldn't to show his wrath, send him to hell, to make his power known, send him to hell, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath, which he made for the purpose of putting them in hell, that he might make known the which of his glory on the ones that he made of mercy, which he prepared, for prepared to go to heaven. 
There's the passage. Destruction, glory. God made some vessels go to hell. There they go. God made some vessels go to heaven. There they go. He shed his blood for this. He didn't shed his blood for that. Since this bunch will reprobate two and then receive Christ, he received Christ for them. <laughs> because it's not of will. Not of him that willeth. But of God. So convincing, isn't it? All right, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 15. John chapter 10, verse 15. Now, this is the system. John 10, 15. These other points here are called unconditional election, which means that God elects without any purpose behind. This other one here is called perseverance of the saints, which means when a man is saved, he'll endure to the end. And I believe that. I believe that. I'm a one-point Calvinist. <laughs> and you can't be a two-point Calvinist without being a five-point Calvinist. If you take any one of these others, you have to take all of them. You suppose I'm a two-point Calvinist, I'm a three-point Calvinist. No, you're not. If you go one step beyond there, you've got to take all four of them. You take irresistible grace, there's no will, you're stuck with it. You take limited atonement, you couldn't have got saved anyway, you're stuck with it. You take unconditional election, you've got a thing where there's no foreknowledge. You take total depravity, you can't by an act of will receive Christ. So I'm what you call a one-point Calvinist. People say, are you a Calvinist? No, absolutely not. I wouldn't profess to be a Calvinist under any condition. Vote to what are you on many? And no, you don't, you don't, you don't get off, you don't get off the hook that easy. Uh, it isn't like that. I'm a Bible-believing Baptist, what I am. Folks say, I'm a uh, Spurgeon with a Calvinist. Well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> I believe Moses murdered a man, David committed adultery, and Noah got drunk, so Spurgeon had his problems too. <laughs> See, if something wrong with you folks, you, you think it isn't straight. You go to the, the marbles aren't going down the slot right, you see. I mean, God can use Spurgeon in spite of his Calvinism. See? Why, John Calvin had Servetus burned at the stake because they disagreed with him on the eternal generation of the Son. Theological point had to do with the Trinity. I wouldn't burn a man at the stake. I wouldn't burn a man at the stake for anything. Not even a him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you had a, you had a, you had a fine, you had a, God, God often gives you blessings you refuse to notice, you know. You had two great blessings this last month. One of them was Rock Hudson kicked the bucket. He looked like a man's man, and he was. <laughs> and then, and then, and then you had that in Frisco, that get out there that shot that mayor, he killed himself. That's a tremendous blessing. I consider that great blessing, you know. And folks say, oh, oh, well, if you react that way, you've been watching too much TV. You're getting brainwashed. Why should innocent people be exposed to that bunch of when you can get rid of them? You folks that love all the you know what the trouble you is? You don't love normal people. Yeah. That wasn't in Romans 9. I just threw that in there. Actually, when you come in. All right, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life not for the world. I lay down my life for the sheep. He dies just for the elect. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, unsaved sheep. They're going to get saved later on. Them also I must bring and share my voice of she one fold and one shepherd. Now that's the system. And that system, the unsaved man is a sheep because potentially he's going to be a sheep. Now it's got problems. And I'll show you what the problems are. All right, now that's the Calvinistic setup. Now I'm not a Calvinist. John Calvin sprinkled babies. I do not sprinkle babies. John Calvin was amillennial. I am not amillennial. Uh, John Calvin believed in limited atonement. I do not believe in limited atonement. John Calvin had a fellow burned at the stake to disagree with him. I would not have a man burned at the stake to disagree with me. I'm not a Calvinist. Oh, right, and I'll show you why I'm not a Calvinist. Ezra chapter 7. Now I will now give you the 40 verses they forgot to tell you about. <laughs> There's always two sides. Ezra 7. The term sovereignty of God is not a Bible expression. 
the term sovereign grace is not a Bible expression. Now, I know sometimes we accommodate. For example, the word premillennial doesn't occur in the Bible. We all know that. The word rapture doesn't occur in the Bible. We all know that. But when you find a term that does occur in the Bible, you better go by it. Or Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7, verse 13. Some of you having trouble finding Ezra there? It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Ezra chapter 7, verse 13. I make a decree that all of they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will, to go up to Jerusalem, go with me. Free will is a Bible expression. Verse 15. And to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel. Verse 16. And all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon for the free will offering of the people and the priests offered willingly for the house and so forth and so on. There's free will. You know who's exercising that free will? Old Testament saints. You know how many Old Testament saints at that time were quickened by the Holy Ghost? None of them. You know how many were born again? None of them. You know how many were the body of Christ? None of them. You know how many were spiritually circumcised? None of them. You know how many were dead in trespass and sin? All of them. That's why these fellows keep trying to make you think, well, they say the same way in the Old Testament or the New Testament, they're trying to get all the elect of God and they are chosen and unconditional. You're not going to do that. There's no new birth in the Old Testament. Because the seed hadn't fallen on the ground and died to bring forth fruit. Christ is the seed, this John 12 that falls on the ground when he comes up, he brings forth the fruit, fruit, and the fruit is you, you're born of him. You're born of his seed. Christ has no seed in the Old Testament. He's the seed of the woman, virgin birth. There is no seed by which a man can be born again till the seed shows up. <laughs> But these, uns these people back in the Old Testament, these saved and unsaved people, the one thing about them, it's all the same. They're all in Adam's image, Genesis 5. Some of them are saved, but when they're saved, nothing happens to them. When you got saved, you got adopted. When you got saved, you got born again. When you got saved, you got justified. You read your Bible, Abraham was not justified till he offered up Isaac. That was 17 years after he was saved. He had righteousness imputed to him in Genesis 15 and wasn't justified in Genesis 22. You get saved and justified right there. You say, well, I never heard of such wild, peculiar teaching. Yeah, the Bible is a peculiar book, isn't it? You know, and all the Ruckman thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong and that kind of stuff. No. Some folks believe it. Some folks don't. Some folks study it. Some folks don't. Somebody says, is that a historic position? Who cares? <laughs> you have to look out for these people who are hung up on historic positions. The historic, fundamental position. Ah, go blow your nose, fella. You know what the historic position was on salvation at the time of Martin Luther? It was faith and works. The historic position was wrong. You know what the historic position was till 1850 of the second coming of Christ? It was post-millennial. It was wrong. You can't trust historic positions. Your know, historic positions were back there all through the Dark Ages on, the, on the, the, the Bishop of Rome. It was wrong. Pastor Robinson, who came over here in the Mayflower, or didn't come, they had to leave him in Holland when he said goodbye to them, he said to, he said to them this. He said, uh, brethren, he said, that John Calvin and Martin Luther were precious shining lights in their days. But these days, the Lutherans have stopped with Luther, and the Calvinists have stopped with Calvin. I am sure that God has much more light to shed forth yet from his precious word. Amen. Robinson wouldn't stop with historic positions. Robinson said, God got something more he's going to show you. It's a good thing you didn't stop with Pastor Robinson. You wouldn't know about the judgment seat of Christ, or the restoration of Israel, or the rapture, or anything else. God got plenty to show. Now, that thing right there is a thing where from there to there, there is no image of God. Christ is the image of God. Didn't you read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 1 and every other place? 
Adam has made the image of God here. The image of God shows up there. From Adam's fall to there, there is no image of God. That's why when Old Testament saint died, he didn't go to he- go to heaven. He went to Abraham's bosom. Somebody said the same in the Old Testament like throughout the New Testament. Then how come they didn't go to the same place? You know why they didn't go to the same place? Because they weren't saved the same way. I grant you, grace is there. See, some of you folks already have a fit already about to have a... I grant you, grace is there. I grant you, no, I know my Bible too. Noah found grace. Now, I'm with you. I read my Bible too. Noah found grace. What you know, I know. No doubt you're the people and wisdom shall die with you. <laughs> Noah found grace. Now, I grant you, grace is there all the way through. I grant you before the law, if grace through faith, I grant you that. But, boy, you get under that law... You get in that law where you just read Nezra, you got a problem. But they got a free will. Calvin's wrong. Exodus 35. Take him under the law. Exodus 35. Take him in a faith and work situation. Exodus 35. In a works and faith situation, the unregenerate saint in the Old Testament has a free will. Exodus 35. Exodus 35, 21. Calvin didn't know what he was talking about. In his day, he was a blessing. Coming out of the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages, he did a lot of good. Folks said, what about the Puritans? Some of them fine folk. And some of them sorry as a devil, too. Those Puritans that burn witches and the Salem witchcraft trials, just rotten as any Roman Catholic pope you've met in your life. So what about the... The puritanical ethnic of hard work, you know, and, and morals, fine, fine, fine. What about the Bible study? Throw it out the window. Exodus 35, verse 21. And when they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, hey man, I thought the heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You know what their heart stirred them up to do? To obey God. Their unregenerate, uncircumcised hearts. Their hearts stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, whose spirit? The man's spirit, small s. What's that, dead spirit? When a man's born again, his spirit's born again, right? That which is born of the spirit is what? Okay. Thought I had, his spirit hadn't been born again, but it stirred him up to do right. And his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering. Verse 22. And they came both many women, as many as were willing-hearted. Verse 25, And all the women that were wise-hearted did to spin with their hands, so forth and so on. Verse 29, And the children of Israel brought a willing offering the Lord, every man and woman whose unregenerate, totally depraved heart, deceitful above all things, made them willing to bring all somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. In the Old Testament, that old un- unregenerate heart could respond toward God or reject God. It's an act of will. You see, when it was involved an act of will, see that? There's nothing moral, immoral about that. I've decided to do it or decided not to do it. Your will isn't affected by your depravity. Your depravity may put pressure on your will, but it can't determine your will. I mean, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right, Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Romans 9, 18. Romans 9, 18. I'm not saying you can get saved by an act of works. I am saying your will has something to do with your salvation. You say, what about that passage where it says, not him that willeth? That's where we're going right now. Romans chapter 9, let's see about that thing. Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy in whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. <laughs> What's that running doing in there? How come you never heard Calvin talk about that runner? Ain't that strange? You can buy Arthur W. Pink's book and read him your red, white, and blue in the face, and you can't find what that runner is doing in there. <laughs> Not of him that willeth, nor hey, runneth, man, runneth. Isn't that strange thing to show up there? I wonder what that refers to. 
Well, don't ask Calvin because he don't know. You can read old Burkhoff and Dabney and Gill and Kuyper and Hodge, you're red, white, and blue in the face, never find out what the fellow's doing to run. Pharaoh wasn't running. This passage here, verse 17, the scripture saith to Pharaoh, he wasn't running, he didn't run anywhere. The only time he ever ran, I guess, when he chased the children of Israel in the Red Sea. Who was doing that running? Ah, 13. Well, the Bible's a wild book. As it's written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Somebody's running. <coughs> Somebody's either running to get the goat's hair in the back of the neck and run there and get the blessing, or else somebody's out there running trying to get the deer in and get that thing shot and bring that there in time to get the blessing before Jacob steals it. Verse 16, It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that receives Christ, no, of God that repents, no, but of God that showeth mercy. Listen, brethren, the statement was that you can't, by an act of will, make God have mercy on you. That was the statement. There was nothing there about receiving Christ. You say, well, when you receive Christ, you get mercy. Yeah, but that's how God set it up. God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Well, Lord, who will you have mercy on? The Lord says, I'll have mercy on those who trust my son. That's God's will. God has determined the means by which he's going to give you mercy. So it is not of him that willeth. You can't say, well, God have mercy upon me. He ain't going to pay attention to you unless you're right there. That's one of the great heresies of this age. If a man just asks God to have mercy upon him, he'll have mercy upon him. He'll have mercy upon you there, and outside of there, there is no mercy. For God so loved the world, he gave, past tense his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, you know mercy outside of right there, brother. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. The mercy is there. And if you don't come there, you're willing to mount the hill of beans. Because God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And if you won't trust Christ, then something else. All right, let's see further about this. So, Exodus chapter 3, verse 19. Let's see about hardening old Pharaoh. Whom he will he hardeneth? Pharaoh, Exodus 3, 19. Now, long before God ever touches this bird, the Lord says, I'm going to tell you how he's going to react before I touch him. Because God has foreknowledge. And election is conditioned on foreknowledge. The election is conditioned upon what God knows is going to take place. Exodus chapter 3, verse 19. I am sure the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. God says that before Moses even goes down there. Lord, so I know what that bird will do. Now, what will he do? Exodus chapter 8, 32. Exodus 8, 32. This is a verse the old Calvinists just pretend isn't in the Bible. Exodus 8, 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Well, that time the Lord didn't harden. Pharaoh hardened it. And, the Lord, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. He'd done it before. It's mutual. It isn't God hardening a fellow. It's God hardening a fellow who hardens himself. Whom he will, he hardens. He hardened Pharaoh. Why? The old boy hardened himself. How did he harden himself? Scripture was Scripture. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. Sola Scriptura. Hebrews chapter 3, 13. Isn't this amazing? Here we've got this far, we haven't had to refer to the original verbally inspired autograph one time. <laughs> Hebrews three thirteen. They must be kind of out of date, I guess, uh, Probably archaic, you know, you couldn't understand them. Hebrews 3, Hebrews 3, 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Watch it, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Why does God harden the fellow? Because of sin. How do you know? 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. 
God hardens whom he will. Sure, that's true. Who does he will to harden? Those that depart from him, those that don't believe on him, those that are living like a devil. Those are the ones he hardens. There's a reason for him hardening Pharaoh. It's sin. Now, old uh, Calvin just didn't like to talk about that. Luke 17, Luke 17. You see, man's free will and man's acts operate right even with God's sovereignty. You won't steal a march on God. I get, I think about these things a lot of times on just in different places. I don't know to think about. I've gone down the beach many a time and just picked up a handful of sand, looked at that thing. Do you think about that? Just a handful of sand? That's a subject worthy of your deepest meditation. <laughs> Where did it come from? So the water walked, cut it out, man. A little thing there, the same shape. If you had rainstorms, if you had 150 feet of rain every day for 15 million years, you couldn't produce a handful of sand. Where'd it come from? It's just on the beaches. <laughs> the little pebbles, all the same shape. Worn down by, worn down. How would they all wear down to the same size? <laughs> Who are you trying to kid, man? Here's a handful. You can't count the ones in a handful. Why, they're all over the beach. But I'm just talking about one beach. What are you going to do with California, the coastline of California and Florida, and Mexico and South America and Africa and India? A little handful of sand. Who made them things? How do you make it? I'd like to see anybody make one. Get me a, 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 a nuclear holocaust, cobalt, bing, bang, bomb, and blow 150,000 of them off and see if you can produce one beach full of sand. You can't do it. Where'd they come from? Something about it. I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a being would do a thing like that? <laughs> and here are all these little pebbles sitting out here. You can't even count the ones you got in the hand. Now, somebody knows what's going on, see? I mean... Whoever that is, you're not going to out-trick him. <laughs> that's, what these, that's what these theological philosophers think. They think some way they can figure this stuff out. You can't figure this stuff out. De we know the eternal decrees of God. He decreed this and he... De Listen, God Almighty can adjust himself to anybody, anytime, anyplace, anywhere. You make any move you want to, boy. He'll adjust himself without making a liar out of himself. He's, he's too variable. <laughs> I mean, now you take up here north. In a while, a couple of weeks maybe, you get a snowfall. Now you ain't been walking through that stuff and shoveling off and eating up your cars for so long, you don't even think about it. Why don't you just pick up a handful of snowflakes sometime and just look what you got in your hand? No two the same? No two the same? They're all six-sided? And no two the same? You realize how many snowflakes fall in Detroit in two months? And what Detroit, just one little old city in one little old state on half side of, how about Canada? How about Nebraska? You get some more, more snow, snow in Wyoming and Montana than you do here. And no two alike. <laughs> you ever see you take that plane and fly over Greenland like I have or Nova Scotia and look down there in eastern Canada and see those snow fields there going for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles and no two alike. Get a computer on that, boy. Get a computer on that. Now, who's doing that thing? You see, with the atmosphere when they go, oh, cut it out. Cut it out, man. <laughs> cut it out. I mean, don't tell me it distills and evaporates and when it comes down, each one just automatically turns into six cut. Just okay, that's for the kids up in the nursery, all right. I mean, if it accidentally, why did one of them come down with eight on it? How about ten sides? How about twelve? I mean, say in 150 billion, you know, in one month, in one place. How about one with seven sides, or four, or two? They all have six. Rough man. So we're trying to say. 
I'm trying to say that God Almighty can leave you completely to your free will every day of your life and never contradict himself once and still work out his plans. What I'm saying? That stupid Calvin, he thought it all had to be ironclad and iron bound or nothing would work. Here's Calvin. God looked down through the ages and said, what's going to happen? And God looked down there and said, I know what I'll do. I'll put that many in heaven, that many in hell. There, now I know what's going to happen. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. See? That's predestination and then foreknowledge. But foreknowledge means before, except in the to a Greek scholar. <laughs> Now, if you pick up Kenneth Lee's little book in Greek Nuggets, you'll find foreknowledge doesn't mean foreknowledge at all. It means a fixed decree. You say, why that? Because Kenneth Lee can't read. He had a reading problem. When I went to school, they taught us how to read. <laughs> now, here in that Bible, the Lord looks down like this down here, and in any one second of time, don't forget them pebbles. <laughs> And in one second of time, don't forget them snowflakes, in one second of time, he comprehends every possibility at one glance. And taking into account every possibility, he fixed certain points and lets the rest of it go. All right, Luke 17, I'll show it to you. Luke 17, 1. How many of you believe that God knows what would have happened to you if you had a wreck this morning? Let me see your hands. Why, well, sure, man. Sure, man. The thing isn't fixed, it's flexible. The stupid hard shell Baptist, two of them came out of a church one time and slipped on the ice and fell down. One of them got up and said, well, thank God that's over with. <laughs> <laughs> now, brother, that's real predestination, man. You get this thing going where everything that happens to you is foreordained for the foundation of the world. You know what you turn into? You turn an egomaniac. Because you'll think that God has just fixed all this stuff for you. Hey, man, you're not that important. I like what Bob Jones Sr. used to say. Bob Jones Sr. said about these Calvinists, he said, you know what you're like? If your concept of God is God way back in eternity, and God looking down through the corridors of time, and he had a telescope, and he sees a speck out there in the distance, and he adjusts his telescope and comes in on it, and it gets bigger, and he can see what it is, and, and you know what it is? It's me. <laughs> No, no, you just ain't that big. You just ain't that big. Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Then see to the disciples, it is impossible, but the offenses will come, but woe to him through whom they come. Now you look at that a minute. It is impossible, but the offenses will come. Somebody has to murder. It's predestinated. Somebody has to commit adultery. It's predestinated. Somebody has to kill and to steal. It's predestinated. Somebody has to commit the abortion, kidnapping. It's predestinated. Somebody has to sell out Christ. Somebody has to crucify Christ. It's predestinated. But woe to him through whom they come. See that? Free will. Don't let it be you. Somebody has to kill. Don't let it be you. Somebody has to steal. Don't let it be you. Now, you know what you have in that verse? You have the sovereignty of God running just like that, and the free will of man running right parallel to it. They never touch a time. God Almighty will leave your free will inviolate. He'll never cross your free will one time in your life. That's how God made you. you run right along with it. You won't out trick him. When you finish fooling around, you'll find that you run right alongside him, just like that. He's still getting done what he wants to get done. The fellow said one time, he said, this thing about sovereignty and the free will of man, he said, it's like a, it's like looking down a railroad track. You look down the railroad track and it, about, you know, four feet apart here, and then on down there it looks like it's about three feet apart, and off there a mile down the track it looks like they come together. You could swear they come together, but you could walk that railroad track until you died of old age and they'd never touch. Now that's the free will of man, that's the sovereignty of God, and if you want to keep your little choo-choo on the rail, you better leave both the rails there. Amen, amen. All right, John 1, 12. Let's see what's wrong with this will bit. John 1, 12. John 1, 12. Nothing like a King James Bible to clear up the seminary education. John chapter 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Watch it. 
which were born, there's the new birth, not of blood, the new human birth, nor the will of the flesh, through any desire of your own or your parents, but, but of God, nor the will of man, but of God. Then the new birth is not by will. No will of the flesh, no will of man. The new birth is by the will of God. It is not him that willeth. So they do have a point. But you see, they, they stole from you. They gave you verse 13, didn't give you verse 12. God doesn't will the new birth this, for this fellow until he does what? Receive Christ. They lied to you. They made you think that the new birth was the equivalent of receiving Christ. The new birth is what happens to you when you receive Christ. You've got to get that thing right. You can't will the new birth before you're saved or after you're saved. But you can will to receive Christ. And when you do, God gives you the new birth. Simple, isn't it? Not for Calvin. <laughs> Matthew 23. Matthew 23. About that will. Matthew 23. They'll lie to you like a dog. They'll give you half the truth every time. Uh, Robert Sumner has a paper called The Biblical Evangelist, and one of his writers is a fellow named Kudelik from Tennessee Temple. And Kudelik has been writing a series of articles for two years to destroy your faith in the King James Bible and the Texas Receptus. And he used the standard arguments. Uh, Sumner put this stuff together in a little old pamphlet called Bible Translations. And that's recommended by the soul of the Lord in Tennessee Temple as a fine, scholarly, helpful work. Another little book in Bible Translations points out that uh, Spurgeon uh, occasionally corrected the King James of the RV, and R.A. Torrey believed that the King James was not perfect. And Sumner's argument and Kudelak's argument is if these good, godly, dedicated, fundamentalist fellows who took the historic position did not believe the King James Bible was inerrant and fallible, what right do you have to believe that? See? That's the argument. Now, aside from the fact that uh, that kind of thinking is just as sick as a sick sow in a snowstorm, I mean, was Noah a preacher of righteousness? Was he a preacher of righteousness? Some of you folks, you don't know, you, you, you don't know he's a preacher of righteousness. <laughs> Second Peter, I'm quoting Second Peter 2.22, if you got to look it up, or chapter 2. All right, he was a preacher of righteousness. Did he get drunk? That means you should. <laughs> Dave is a man after God's own heart, amen? Could you trust him with your wife? Not on furlough <laughs> or on leave. <laughs> Does that mean you should commit adultery? Our Torah and Spur Spurgeon were godly men, undoubtedly. They corrected the King James Bible. Does that mean you should? See? Somebody, somebody, there's something on the mind. Somebody has lost their marbles. They're not playing with a full deck. The pilot light got blown out. They're a candidate for the funny farm. And they're going around posing as fundamentalist leaders. The biblical evangelist. Ah, your father's mustache, kid. The biblical evangelist. You know what they do? They give you 50%. Give you old Spurgeon down there saying, this verse should be this, and the RV has better than this. Don't correct the Bible when you don't have to to show your vainglorious education, but correct in truth where necessary. That's half. You want to see the other half? Get the sword of the Lord for September about 1973, where old Spurgeon the pulpit, that King James Bible, saying, this is God's book. God wrote this book. And he says about this book, he says, if this is the writing of God, I should read it. I should love it. I kiss this book. This is God's book, written with the very hand of God. Take your Bibles home, read them, for they are the words of God. If God wrote this book, I should bow before this book and kneel in the pulpit. That's the other half. How come you didn't find that in the sword of the Lord or the biblical evangelist in the last ten years? I've got the clipping. I keep, I keep tabs on them, boy. I got the thing cut out and pasted in my doomsday book. Now, folks, let me ask you something. Suppose I get up here and say, uh, people, I've got a car I drive, the 1980 uh, Chevrolet van, 
and I got a wife and seven kids and eight grandchildren. When I stand up here from another group and I say, I'm just kidding about that van. I drive a Volkswagen and I've got a wife and two kids and no grandchildren. Can you reconcile that? Why, in one of those places I lied. Amen? What, do you, what would you call it? Wait, he's accommodating himself to the popular mind. Well, he's using this expression because the people understand it better. He's a liar. <laughs> One time Spurgeon lied. Which time was it? Folks, that's all there is to it. I don't know why these fellows can't think. I, I don't, I don't, you never heard me profess to be a scholar in my life. Ruffin thinks he's a scholar. I don't, I don't profess myself to be a scholar at all, man. I'm a student of the Word of God. You never heard me say I was a scholar? Somewhere, you got that table about a third of my books up there. I've got 59 books in print, and not a one of them says I'm a scholar. Or even profess to be a scholar. But I got some sense. I can tell when a fellow's lying. <laughs> now, when Spurgeon said you ought to correct it, was he telling the truth? Or was he telling the truth when he said God wrote it and he bowed before it? One Spurgeon is wrong. Will the real Charles Haddon Spurgeon please stand up? <laughs> now, let me show you what's going on fundamentally today. Here's one Spurgeon there, and another, here's R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey. Of course, only the original manuscripts are inspired, and the original autographs are inspired, and there is an old translation. In many places, the ASV is much more accurate than the King James. Over here. I was raised to be the Bible of the Word of God. My mother taught me the Bible of the Word of God. Ever since I was born, I'll be the Bible of the Word of God. And one day, a brilliant skeptic intellectual convinced me it wasn't, and I was in a turmoil for many years. Finally, I had to come to terms with God. I said, this book is the Word of God, or it's not. I began to study the Bible. It's funny, when you begin to read God's Word, how it draws you close to God. I know the Bible is the Word of God because I've read the Bible and know it proved to be the Word of God. Got the right one over there, the right one over there. Now listen, folks, I never split a church in my life. I never split a fellowship in my life. I am causing no division today among Christians. You know what caused the divisions? Two Spurgeons, two Tories, two Truman Dollars, two A.V. Hendersons, two Athmans, two Faulkners, two Curtis Hudsons. They're double. I'm not double. I will let this book say this book is the Word of God from cover to cover, including the cover. I mean this book right here. You say, which one? This Gideon Bible I found in my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Now tell me something. What is so difficult about figuring me out when I'm that simple? I'll be the Bible I have in my hand is the Word of God. That's it. Got the Word of God right there. You say, which edition? Who cares? I don't, any edition. And this King James Bible is just fine. See, I'm on a single track, hung up, stuck, rooted, grounded, solidified, cemented, and you won't move me short of torture. If you hear me someday tonight, the King James Bible is the Word of God, you know I'm being tortured. <laughs> That's right. I'm fixed. Let me tell you something. When a crowd gets fixed in something, he's fixed. You convince a crowd a certain position is so, and you'll have hell to pay trying to get him un... Ain't that right, Brother Lonho? <laughs> Amen. God stems, y'all. <laughs> now, you take, that, you take that thing right there. If you can convince a crowd the trouble is a Jew, he'll kill everyone on earth. Too bad they didn't convince him somebody else was the trouble. <laughs> 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 but that... And you, you convince a crowd that Bible is the Word of God, and he'll be... I'm convinced. I ain't the problem. I, you know what divides them? They have to choose. Now, I've chosen. You know what I think? I think the Tory and the Spurgeon that talked over here were temporarily out of their right mind. I think they were trying to impress scholars. I think their Adamic nature got the best of them. They have two natures. I think like David came into adultery and Noah got drunk and moved us, killed the fella. I think the old nature in Tory and Spurgeon occasionally led them to put on a show and strut their education before men. And back to their position here. I believe the God-filled, spirit-filled new man in Christ is over here magnifying the Word of God. 
I choose this position. The brethren choose both positions. Then they split the body of Christ. And I haven't. I'm just innocent. My conscience is pure as driven snow, man. Matthew 23, verse 37. Matthew 23, 37. Now about this will. Matthew 23, 37. This is Jesus speaking. Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent to thee. Watch it. How often would I, there's the will of God, have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers the chickens under her wings, and ye would uh, not. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, when I read that verse there, you didn't quite catch it about grant and repentance to the Gentiles. When I read that thing, you thought it, you thought it said granted repentance to the elect, <laughs> but it didn't say to the elect. It said to the Gentiles. You know what that means? That means any Gentile can repent. Why? Because God granted repentance to the Gentiles. It's funny how that thing slips in there and see but you can't see it. One well, the fellow says, well, he, gave, he gave repentance to the elect from the Gentiles. It didn't say that. It said Gentile. Any Gentile in this town can be saved. Here's a good one for you. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee. In your mouth. I want to say, dead trespass and sin, got it in his mouth. And in your heart, the unsaved man is the word of salvation in his heart and his mouth. All you got to do is confess. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thy heart, thou shalt be saved. That's written to the Romans 10, the Gentiles. They had a Gentile of heaven and earth that can't be saved. Just like that. He's been given repentance, he's been given enough faith to be saved, and it's right in his mouth and right in his heart. All he's got to do is use it. He just won't use it. You do what the hell. You damn yourself, brother. First Timothy two four. First Timothy two four. All this stuff. First Timothy two four. They'll give you half the truth. They won't give you all the truth. The biggest lie you ever heard in your life is a half truth. First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy 2. Be consistent. If you don't believe the book, tell folks you don't believe. I've got, I've got, I got nothing wrong with it. I've got nothing against these fellows. Honest to God, they think I do. I got nothing against them. I don't care anything about their personal lives. I can't tell you who Truman Dollar married, who he didn't marry, how long he's been married, how many kids he's got, if he's flirting with someone in the choir or not, or what his wife does for a living. I, I don't pay attention to people's personal matters. They mean nothing to me at all. I've been up to this church how many times? How long have I been up here, brother? Nine years. In this church, I know Brother Noe. I know his wife. I know this brother here, but I had to ask you his last name of the night when I wanted to get some information about him. I've been up here for nine years. I don't know the name of, I don't know the name of in this church. Nine years. I know Brother, brother Noe and his wife. I couldn't hear the name of one of his girls. Not a one of them. I, you say, why is that? I'm telling you. I don't have any personal bone to pick with a man, woman, or child on the face of this earth. I don't even pay that much attention to people. <laughs> I went to Beach and Bricks Church every year for 17 years. 17 years. That time he wouldn't have dollar in the pulpit. But you have me in. 17 years. You know how many people I know over there at that, that church by name? I know Larry Bartlett and Bill Bartlett. That's the end of it. In 17 years. You went to front of the church 17 years and picked up the names of two people. <laughs> you say, why is that? You're not much interested in people. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I find that people are kind of like taking a, you get, you know, familiarity breeds content. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. You just let out a can full of worms, man. I mean, I'm satisfied to shake hands with people, know people, and have them support me, and me support them, and love them and pray for them, but I'm not interested in poking my nose in all the cotton-picking private business. I never have been and never will be. The bone I've got to pick with these fellows is that book. Now, outside that book, I don't care what to do or why they do it. It means nothing to me. I don't go stick my nose around there. Not about to. You know what i got against these birds? 
I've got to, I think I've got to get these birds to stand that pulpit waving this King James Bible around and saying, this is the Word of God, glory to God, this doesn't contain the Word of God, this is the Word of God from cover to cover, this is the verbally inspired, amen, amen, hallelujah, when they don't believe it. I mean, just be honest. If you don't believe it, just tell them you don't believe it. Get up and say, now I'm going to use the King James Bible because I prefer it as the best translation, and most of you folks agree with it. I do not think it's the best translation. I think the ASV is the best translation. But I'm not going to use it because uh, you have King James. I don't want to offend you, so I'm going to use this. Then begin to preach. You said that wouldn't work. <laughs> no, it sure wouldn't. <laughs> and that's why they're dishonest. <sighs> First Timothy chapter 2. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. First Timothy 2. All I want to do is quit lying. First Timothy 2. That ain't much to ask, is it? Thank you, brother. <laughs> 2 4, or 2 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Watch it. Who will, there's the will of God, have all men to be saved, not just the elect. All men to be saved to come to knowledge of the truth. You know what the all men is in that context? Look at verse 1. Any unsaved man to face this earth. Verse 2. It's God's will to save unsaved men. Now, Calvin couldn't stand that. To him, that make God weak. Sometimes a fellow body's bodily infirmity will affect his theology. Now, understand that. I'm not saying it, it, it shouldn't, it probably will, but you have to be careful. Calvin was sickly all his life, very sickly. I had a German philosopher years ago, his name was Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche was a, was a philosopher of all philosophers. You want to get the king of philosophy, that's the boy. And that little boy was sick and weakly all his life, so he got this idea the greatest virtue was strength, because he didn't have it. And the greatest virtue was power, because he wasn't powerful. And he erected the superstructure of uh, Hitler's theology, Superman. That came from Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. And Cobb was sickly all his life, and to him the, the greatest crime was being weak. And so to him, God had to have his way all the time, and as well all the time, man could do nothing to resist it. And Calvin's thinking was, if God wanted all men to be saved and some of them weren't, that would defeat God's purpose. And since God's purpose couldn't be defeated, the only answer was he must just want it to damn this bunch didn't get saved. Otherwise, man would overrule God. You see? In other words, he had a good motive for setting up his thing. He wanted to give God the glory and make God sovereign. But that, that, uh, that slanders God. That makes God unholy. That makes God condemning a fellow who doesn't deserve condemnation. For that reason, I always subscribe more to John Wesley than Calvin. I'm not an Arminian, but, but I always loved, I always loved Wesley. Wesley always, he always talked about the holiness of God. That's the thing that impresses me. You don't impress me about God? His holiness. I mean, these pebbles in the beach and these snowflakes, that's impressive. But if the God that did that wasn't holy, wouldn't you be in a mess? Wouldn't you be in a mess? If God was all sovereign and wasn't holy, he'd be a devil. I'm with, I'm with Wesley. I think the greatest thing about God is his holiness. Are oh, you take that thing right there? If God will for me saved and they weren't saved, that man's opposing God's will. Calvin wouldn't stand for that. Calvin said that God have his will no matter what man wills. Well, I'm not, I'm not too much in that either. I'll tell you, look at that thing. I see those snowflakes. I'll tell you about that handful of sand there. And then I think about the times I pitted my will against God and had my way instead of his way. Hadn't that happened to you? You think John Calvin said, he does all of him that willeth, you know, for it is God that willeth in you both to do of his good pleasure. So it's God in you that makes all these decisions. <laughs> I'll guarantee you I've made some decisions God didn't make. I'll flat guarantee you, brother. 
You say, how do you know? I know what his book said about those decisions. The trouble these hyper-Calvinists, they're holy, they're pious, sanctified. You ever hear one of them talk? Oh, beloved of God, yes, the good Lord, of the Lord. That's a funny way of talking, you know. The sovereign grace, oh, God's remarkable sovereign grace, when I am a poor sinner, plead to the Lord, and the Lord has mercy upon my soul, then I know, shut your cut and make a mouth, you hypocrite. Nobody talks that way naturally. So I stand at the door. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Smith. So glad to see you. Oh, bless God, the little children. They look so fine. Oh, glory to God. Don't talk that way. That's an actor. That's a hypocrite. You know, I'll get back to this in a minute, but you know, uh, one reason I like Brother Noah is he talks the same way at a dinner table he does up here in the pulpit. Why should it be any different? But it doesn't cover up. I shouldn't talk any different here in a ball field or in a fishing boat or in the bathroom or the kitchen. So I get up here and put on all this stuff. Oh, beloved of God. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed. You know, I've studied the American people and I, every year I come more and more to the conclusion Loloff did when he said America's in the same asylum run by the inmates. I believe that. I mean that all Roberts. I saw five hundred foot Jesus and he told me to build this dump out here and the people send him the money. They send him the money. They actually send the, the guy writes out a check. I can't imagine it. Just blows my mind, man. Some write a check five hundred dollars for a five hundred foot Jesus gonna build a dental building. What a thing, man. What a thing. And that fellow out there in California, that groom in the Chinese theater, that half fruit cake or whatever he is out there, though uh, you know. And so we see the guys, <laughs> they're always smiling, you ever notice that? Uh, Jerry Firewell is good at that too, you know, <laughs> so every time you see him, he's smiling. <laughs> if you see me, your face would get kind of strained after a while, you know, you want just take it out. <laughs> You have, you have no idea how much fun I have as a Christian. <laughs> you say, why? Because to me, there's nothing sacred but the Lord and the Bible. To me, the Lord's holy and the Bible's holy and the rest. You know, I'll take it or leave it. <laughs> All right, First Timothy chapter 2. I'm not through yet. 2-5. For there's one God, one mediator. You got me off here this morning. I, I, was, I was going to get through this, getting up, but you get me off. You're getting my mind going up. You're just channels. <laughs> It's your fault. <laughs> Five, for there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, watch it, who gave himself a ransom for many, all. How come he gave you the one in Matthew and didn't give you the one in First Timothy? You say, why do you say many one place all the time? Because uh, all is many, isn't it? Now, many may not be all, but I'll tell you one thing, all is many. No, oh, yeah, it's all that. You just have to, you don't have a normal mind, you know. Romans chapter 8, 28, 29. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. Now, the two times that word predestinate shows up in that book, and neither time is it a reference to salvation. Not one time. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to get saved. No, sir. He predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. That doesn't take place till after you receive Christ. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. Now we'll get back where we started, and this time we'll get it right. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Here's where we started. Ephesians 1, 4. And this time we'll get it right. The word predestination is never referenced to anybody's salvation. Not a time. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us under what? The adoption of children. You see, Calvin mistook that for salvation. That isn't salvation. That's what happens to you when you get saved. You're adopted as a child of God. That didn't happen in the Old Testament. How you know it didn't happen in the Old Testament? Paul told you in Galatians. Paul told you the Galatians, that fellow was under a tutor until the time appointed by the Father, and after the Lord came, you received the adoption. You weren't adopted in the Old Testament. That's a New Testament operation. Calvin just couldn't 
get his Bible right. All right, verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Oh, I see. It didn't say according as he chose us when we were in him before the foundation of the world. It said he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Well, then Calvin didn't read that one right. He had you in Christ back here. The verse didn't say that. The verse said God chose you in Christ. When were you in Christ? When you received him. You see, the fella, the, 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 the screws didn't work right. The, the gears wouldn't work. If you were in Christ before the foundation of the world, when Adam showed up, where were you? Where were you? Well, you're in Adam. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall be made alive. Do you mean to tell me you were in Christ and fell out of Christ and got into Adam and fell out of Adam and got back in Christ? Why not fall out again? Just keep on working it. <laughs> well, that's nonsense. You weren't in Christ and then out of Christ and then in Adam and then out of Adam and then in Christ. God chose you when? When you got in Christ. When did you get in Christ? When he put you in. When he put you in. When you received him. <laughs> is, is there anything difficult about this? <laughs> Nothing difficult about it. Just make it hard. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Did you know that's why the, all these hyper-Calvinists have such a terrible time with the salvation? We got one down in Pensacola, the L.R. Shelton son. L.R. Shelton out in New Orleans with a big boy down south. L.R. Shelton Jr. is on the radio every Sunday morning down there. Every Sunday it's the same ghastly stuff. Just, just 15 minutes of just pure, unadulterated baloney. And the gist of every one of those broadcasts is this. Here's the gist. Oh, yes, if you feel God striving your heart, then you know that you've been quickened by the Holy Spirit, and you wouldn't repent and feel sorry for your sins and see that you're a sinner going to hell unless God had already done the work in your heart. So you should keep on and strive to know Christ fully, knowing that if you know Christ fully, you're one of his elect. Don't give up. Continue to mourn and pray before God and repent. What's he saying? He's saying, work your way to heaven. Hyper-Calvinism leads to a hyper-Arminianism. He don't know he's saved right now. All this stuff. I've seen him in himself. You know, he's there. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord of all. Well, that sounds real pious and real holy, but that's just about a big lie that fell off the back end of a Jehovah's Witness truck. You know what that's saying? That's saying if you're not living 100% for God, completely sold out a sinless life, you've never been saved. Listen, if he's not Lord of all, your family, your tithe, your time, your health, your talents, he's not Lord at all, you haven't trusted him as your Savior. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Shelton says you can't believe him as your Savior unless you take him as your Lord. That's a lie. Acts chapter 10, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. <laughs> you mean to tell me Peter wasn't saved? He's arguing with the Lord. But he's saved. Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. I'm going. You better hadn't. <laughs> well, I'm going anyway. You'll be sorry for it. Well, I love the Lord. I know you're not going to die for me. You've got no business down there. Don't go down there. But I've got burden for the Jews. I'll take care of that. You get to Rome. Well, I'm going. You wind up in jail. Don't care if I do. You might get killed. i got enough nerve for that. Okay, but you're still wrong. <laughs> And he went down there, and don't you tell me Paul wasn't saved. No, these hyper Calvinists trying to do trying to talk you out of your salvation. All right, Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Were you a sheep before you were saved? Why, well, listen, brother, before you were saved, you were dead. You were a child of wrath. You were a child of disobedience. You were alone. You were in the world without hope without God, without Christ, and the Lord didn't even know who you were. I'll show you. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. Galatians chapter 4, I think it's verse 9, yeah. But now after you have known God, comma, or rather are known of God, for you were saved, you were just a blank cipher. You were just a dead sinner. 
and God had mercy upon you and got through shoes through scrape after scrape after scrape, not because he knew you personally, you were a friend of his, but just because he has God's God's merciful of fools and drunkards. So I had double protection. <laughs> you take that kind of thing, he says to a certain bunch of people, depart from me, I never knew you. You remember that thing? The ones he knows, the ones that are in him. Before you're in him, you were a Gentile dog. You said, what about those other sheep? Well, you have to look out for John. John's a rough, tough book. Oh, John says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Every branch that abideth in me, you know, and if he doesn't abide, he is cast forth as a branch. You got to look out with those similitudes, you know, sheep, that kind of stuff. Do you know that the only people called a sheep anywhere in that Bible in the Old Testament are Jews? So I'll read Ezekiel chapter 33, 34, 35. When Christ said, I got other sheep of this fold, he's talking about a Jewish fold there and getting Jews with dispersion in there. He's not talking about unsaved Gentile dogs. All right, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Let's see about that there, limited atonement. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Now, I'm not saying that Christ just died for the sheep. I'm saying the sheep in John is not a reference to unsaved Gentiles. Second Peter 2. Do you know what Christ's blood is called in Acts chapter 20, 28? Does anybody know? God's blood. God's blood. That's why to an Englishman the word bloody is the worst cuss word in the English language. When you go to England, for goodness sake, don't say the bloody this and the bloody that, because to an Englishman when you say blood, you know what you're doing? You're cursing by the blood of Christ. That's the worst oath a man can cuss, see? That's worse than just saying, you know, GD or something else. You say bloody. Because for an Englishman, odds blute and odds bodkins is God's blood and God's body. It's an old Catholic thing, see? So if God had blood, and Acts 20, 28 said he had, tell me something. How limited would it be? God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The life of the flesh is in the what? All right, if eternal life is in Christ, what kind of blood does he have? Well, it has to be eternal. You can't limit it. These fellows have a problem. I go down, go down the bank. I got a check from uh, Rockefeller, $150,000. I got Chase National Bank. I go to Florida National Bank and said, will that do? They say, yeah, that'll do. Sign it. I said, I don't have to sign this check. Got his name on there. He said, well, we need a receipt. And I said, well, I <laughs> give me my money. I'll give you the receipt. And they said, no, you've got to sign it before you get the money. <laughs> you know what's going on down there? I come to the bank, and I've got a thing there, and it says, a payment's been made for me, and it's been shed, and i got the name of God's son across that thing, and I want to cash it. It's for me. They say, put your name on it as a receipt. I won't do it. You go to hell if you don't do it. There have been enough blood shed to pay for anybody's sins. But you've got to put your John Henry down to collect. Amen. That's what's going on. So, you know what old Calvin said? He said the, there were just enough checks made out for the elect people to cash the checks. Yeah, you bet there was. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Second Peter 2, 1. There were false prophets among the people, even if there be false teachers among you, who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies. Watch it. Even denying the Lord that what? 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 Again. Is it bought or brought? Bought. You know what to buy something means? Why, sure, he purchased false teachers and prophets. His blood paid for them. Calvin didn't know what he was talking about. Hebrews chapter 10, limited atonement. You know what Charles Wesley, the songwriter, said about Calvin's theology? He said, Oh, horrible decree, worthy of the place from which it came, forgive their hellish blasphemy, but charge it to the Lamb. <laughs> Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10, verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood 
the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing and had done despite the spirit of grace. They're both stepping underfoot the blood of Christ and it was shed to sanctify him. There's no limited atonement to it. All right, Matthew chapter 11, we're about through. Matthew chapter 11, verse 21. About this grant and repentance. Matthew 11, 21. According to Calvin, only the elect can repent because God only grants repentance to the elect. And if you're one of the elect, you can't repent. Wouldn't we, preachers, wouldn't we, wouldn't we have a terrible time of if Calvin told the truth? Here we are standing up here saying, repent, and a hundred of them can't even do it. <laughs> We're saying believe, and 50 of them couldn't believe if they tried. Isn't that something? Saying, you know, you say, well, they're dead. Well, why send them to hell then? If the guy is dead and can't receive Christ, how can you hold him responsible for rejecting Christ? Crazy, cockeyed system. The dead fellow can't do nothing, but he's held responsible for rejecting Christ. Well, how can you do that and not hold him responsible for accepting Christ? If the man can accept, he can reject. You can't send the fellow to, to hell if he, if he couldn't accept. Well, that's Calvin's peculiar kind of thinking. Let's see if they could have repented. Matthew eleven twenty one. Woe to thee, Chorazin, woe to thee, Bethesda. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented. They didn't repent. But they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. The ones that went to hell would have repented if they'd seen what Korah and Bethesda had seen. That means they could have repented because Christ said they would have repented. Therefore, the non-elect can repent. All right, John chapter 12, verse 32. How many ever had a, a coward to say to you, no man can come to me except the Father draw him? Did you ever hear that one? That's a good one. All right, John chapter 12, John chapter 12, verse 32. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. John twelve thirty two, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Anybody can come. Christ's crucifixion draws them. When Christ said in John 6, No man come to me except the Father draw him, he's talking on earth, talking to disciples. When here he said, I'm lifted up, I'll draw all of them. That isn't all. You know what the Bride of Solomon says back there in the Song of Solomon? She says, draw me, we will run after thee. What could be more silly than a Calvinist sitting around saying, I just ain't drawn. I got to be drawn. If the Holy Spirit don't draw me, I... Hey, son, get out of your face to the altar and ask God to draw you. You see where the will comes in? The fellow won't do it. You know, your knees there and say, now, Lord, you said I couldn't come unless you draw me. In the name of Jesus Christ, draw me. He won't pray that, though. You know, I won't pray that. Sin. All that stuff is. Blaming your sins on God. All right, Acts chapter 11, 18. This will be the last one. Acts chapter 11, 18. And with Acts chapter 11, verse 18, the other hand, pick up Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is what's given you by the Trinitarian Bible Society of London, England whom I have the greatest respect for, for their work in the King James Bible. I keep all their material, and you often use it. But the Trinitarian Bible Society of London, England, is a hard-shell, five-point, tulip, hyper-dispensational, Bullingerite, Calvin job. And the first president of Trinitarian Bible Society was good old Ethel Bullinger himself, who set up the dry cleaner system. And so the Trinitarian Bible Society are five-point tulip Calvinists. And their main verse for proving Calvinism is this verse. Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11. Uh, I don't want Acts chapter 11. I gave you the wrong one. I want Acts chapter 14. Uh, Acts chapter 14. Um, um, i got a Bible on me. don't have any cross-references. That might be it. 11 what? What? 11, 18? No. I want the one that says, uh, and as many as Lord ordained eternal life believes. 1348. That's what I want right there. Acts uh, 1348. Acts 1348. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many 
as were ordained to eternal life believe. So the ones that weren't ordained to eternal life couldn't believe. See how beautiful that is? I mean, if you're ordained to eternal life, then down there you believe. And if you're not ordained to eternal life, then you don't believe. See how logical that thing sounds? That's Trinitarian Bible Society. Now, what about that? I'll look in Acts 13 where you're reading. You see what that is? 48, the Gentiles. 47, the Gentiles. 42, the Gentiles. Who are those Gentiles? Those are Gentiles that are connected with the Jewish synagogue, 42. And old Paul gets up to preach of that bunch in Acts chapter 13. He says in 16, Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, Jews, and ye that fear God, Gentiles, give audience. He's talking to Jews and Gentiles who have not yet heard the gospel. Let's see what this ordination is. I said Romans chapter... One, make it Romans 2. Make it Romans 2 and begin at verse 5. The one place these fellows picked to prove Calvinism was a works passage. The one place they picked. The one place they picked for ordaining to eternal life had to do with works. Romans 2, 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up to thyself wrath, against the day of the wrath and revelation and righteous judgment of God, who render every man according to his deeds. Watch it. To them who by patient continuance works in well-doing works, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to them that are contentious and not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, works, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh, 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 to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. You know what you have in Acts chapter 13? You have a bunch of Gentiles who've been doing good works and seeking immortality and eternal life and doing well and seeking God and trying to find God, and because of that they're ordained to eternal life and get it when Paul shows up. That's what you've got right there. And their ordination to eternal life in that passage was based on works. It had nothing to do with that thing at all. It had to do with the fact that in Romans you're told, if the Gentile follows his conscience, it'll take him to God. And if the Jew follows the law, it'll take him to God. That's a dispensational shot that has Gentiles in the Old Testament waiting for the truth and seeking for the truth, so when the truth shows up, they accept it. You know what the outstanding character that illustrates that in the New Testament is? It's Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. A certain man, a just and good report, who gave alms and prayed to God always. And an angel said, Go get Simon Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. Why? Because of works, 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 works. The fellow isn't saved by works. He's saved by grace through faith, but he's ordained to it if he's come along the right way. Now, think about that. Trinitarian Bible Society, the only pass they could find was an Arminian passage. <laughs> okay. So much for that. Now, we've got one more to take care of here, and that's this mess down here.